Hi folks, sorry for the delay here. We'll get started in just a minute. Well, hi, everybody. This is Dean Woodbeck from In Common Internet 2. Thanks for joining us for today's IAM Online. And I will turn it over to our moderator for today, who's the identity management guru at the University of Illinois, Keith Wessel. Take it away, Keith. All right. Thank you, Dean. Hi, everybody, and uh, welcome to this month's IAM Online. Uh, before we start, we want to remind you that IAM Online is brought to you by In Common Internet 2 and the EDUCAUSE Higher Education Information Security Council. And we are gonna be taking questions in the chat as we usually do, but now we're on Zoom. So you have a new interface to get used to. If you're not used to the chat on Zoom, you'll see the button at the bottom of your screen. Do note that you need to click that button if you wanna see the chat that's going on um, or obviously, if you want to ask a question in the chat. So please send those questions in. We'll have opportunities uh, both uh, during the presentations and if there's time left at the end for us to get our panelists to answer your questions. Today's topic is identity matching or will the real Jane Doe please stand up? And we have two excellent speakers to talk to you today about the area of identity matching and their experiences. Ben Oshran, he is with us. Uh, he has 20 years of IT experience in higher ed, and he is now the architect for the co-manage project. He's also the managing partner of the Spherical Cal Group. And Summer Scanlon, she is a data analyst and she manages communication uh, for the help desk for CalNet which is the Identity Management and Access Control Group at UC Berkeley. So before we get into hearing from our panelists, let's just step back a little bit and make sure we all know what we're talking about when we say identity matching. What is identity matching is the question. It's not the same as identity linking. Uh, if you tuned into the IAM online back in June, you heard a presentation on IAM link, identity linking and how one can link different identities, social and on-prem. Identity linking and identity matching can be related. One can be the result of the other, but the focus here today is the identity matching. And what that means is, how do you know that person A and person B are the same people? Uh, it's useful for onboarding, obviously, when someone first comes along. Uh, that's actually the question from the IAM online way back in February uh, about roles and groups uh, that was asked that inspired today's IAM online. And identity matching, it's worth noting, is harder today than it ever was before, just because person data and identity data is becoming so sensitive. So you might ask yourself, why bother with identity matching? And we thought this was a good question to ask before we dove into the meat of today's presentation. If someone was part of your institution before and they come back, who cares if they get another identity? Who cares if they get another net ID? Does it really matter if it's the same as the one they had before? Well, the answer is in many cases, yes. If you're one of those lucky people who it doesn't matter at your school. Well, then you can just sit back and see if you learn any uh, good, uh, new, new good jokes in the rest of the hour. But for the rest of us, it is important for preventing multiple identities. Um, and for users with multiple roles, oftentimes the identity will be uh, tied to the role at the school. And it's important with the way that those roles work that the same person in the student system is also in the HR system uh, with, with that identity. Obviously, there's fewer passwords to manage if you only have one identity. And now that we're moving to MFA, where in many cases, multiple identities can cost more money for you, it's financially beneficial 
Uh, and it's just a better experience for the user. Maybe they come with two identities and, and they, they have to contact the help desk to get them cleared up. Wouldn't it be great for the user experience if from the get-go we say, oh, this person is the same as somebody who is already here in another role. So we'll just map this same identity to this new student role, a staff member who begins taking classes, for instance. But you gotta be careful with identity matching, of course, because if you have a false positive and you think A and B are the same people, but they're not, you can very quickly end up with a tangled mess. So with that, we're going to dive into some of the technical background of identity matching, and I'm going to turn things over to Ben. All right. Uh, thank you, Keith. I am just switching over the screen share now. And done. OK, uh, so I'll start by providing some background as to the problem space and some solutions that have been thrown around uh, over the years. Uh, then we'll uh, hand it over to Summer to talk a little bit about what's going on at uh, Berkeley, University of California, Berkeley. And then uh, after that, we'll come back and talk a little bit about what's going on uh, in tier. Uh, so let's start with some background. Um, this problem, meaning identity matching, has been around for a while, basically dating back to when we started uh, giving out email accounts uh, to people on campus. Um, there's a fundamental question in trying to do something like that, and, and there are other problems solvable uh, that require similar solutions, not just email, for example, giving out ID badges. But the, the problem is, how do you know who to give them to? Who is everyone? And as I'm sure many or all of you are familiar with, uh, there's often not one sole source of authoritative information on campus. HR knows who the employees are, the registrar knows who the students are, et cetera. So this problem of having multiple authoritative systems of record with overlapping populations for identity management purposes leads us to having to effectively solve the match problem. Obviously, the larger the campus, the more complex and the more complex the data sources, the, the worse the problem gets. Today, it's, it's basically the same problem as it was back in the 90s, uh, although more complicated. You know, students are now applying via commercial applications that you may or may not have meaningful control over. Uh, after uh, being uh, after being accepted or matriculating, the students are transferred to the registrar for management. Eventually, students become alumni and attract via alumni relations. They might be hired as employees, in which case they're now also in HR. Of course, somebody might start in HR and then eventually make their way into the student system. Um, if your HR system is like many other HR systems out there, even if it's a quote unquote new modern cloud-based system, your business processes might get in the way. And so you might have an early onboarding process so your new faculty can get access to resources three months before they're hired. And now you have to match your early onboarding system to your HR system. Of course, guests and affiliates come from everywhere. And if you've got a hospital attached to your university, that's just an entirely new set of people to deal with, whether it's uh, uh, practicing physicians and other employees who have access to campus resources, uh, et cetera. And so uh, while a single identity isn't necessarily a strict requirement, it certainly makes the proper access management uh, of the resources that people are trying to get to uh, easier. Over the years, there have been a, a few th themes and a few approaches that have developed. Um, variation one is probably the most common, uh, which is matching at registry. So if you've got multiple systems of record feeding into a common identity registry, then the registry itself either performs the match or proxies a call out to some sort of matching engine uh, to determine if the person is known already. Um, the second variation involves matching at the SOR, so this, when a person is added to the student system or the HR system, that system calls out to a matching engine, gets a response back, and then passes that information on to the registry. And then a third variation is basically matching before the system of record or, or self-service identity claiming, which is where a, a new employee or a new student signs up at a, a portal effectively that grants nothing but a net ID, and then that identity is uh, passed to the systems of record as part of the onboarding process. But regardless of which variation uh, is, is in use, there are similar considerations, one being the quality of the inbound attributes. Your matching algorithms are only going to be as good as the data that they have access to. And unfortunately, that data is often very limited. Uh, and the problem of handling ambiguous or fuzzy or potential matches. So what happens when you have a person who is uh, 
you know, maybe the same as somebody who's already known to the system. Well, each of these variations still needs some sort of intervention process to address that. Uh, I dug up this uh, diagram, which is a little hard to read, but uh, it shows sort of a typical uh, identity uh, match flow for a new person. Uh, this came out of some of the early uh, straw man work, which I'll talk about again uh, in a minute. Uh, but uh, you can see here, this talks about the variations one and two from the previous slides. Uh, it starts by a new person showing up at the system of record. And then in this case, it says, uh, if you follow flow one down, the system of record notifies IDMS. Uh, uh, you could probably replace that with registry and, and make this a little bit more coherent in current terminology. But the idea in flow one is the uh, registry then requests reconciliation and flow two, the system record requests reconciliation. If there's an ambiguous result from that, then what happens depends on whether or not we can pass choices back to the requesting system. If the requesting system is interactive, meaning it can display the choices to the administrator entering the original data, as you might have in a, say, a guest management system, then the requesting system can provide choices back to the uh, person doing the data entry and then uh, that person can select the appropriate uh, match. Uh, obviously, there's uh, data privacy and, and data control issues around that, uh, but uh, we'll, we'll skip over those for the moment. Uh, if the requesting system is not in track for a match administrator who is presumably part of either the um, uh, help desk or identity management group to, uh, to handle. Uh, one way or another, if this process completes and or it wasn't an ambiguous result to begin with and we end up with a new person record, uh, perhaps. If not, we just attach the attributes to the existing record. If it's a new person, then we ask, assign a what we're calling engine asserts for a person. And at that point, we send out whatever notifications we need to do and the process is complete. So over the years, uh, there have been some solutions sort of in this space. Uh, most of it is probably legacy custom code that people write in whatever their favorite scripting language is. You know, I bet there's a good chunk of Perl out there still doing this work. Uh, there have been a couple of commercial solutions that are sort of in this space. Um, they're often expensive and some are better than others. Um, there hasn't been much in the way of open source uh, until now. And We'll talk about that later. Uh, although you could sort of hack something together from master data management solutions if you were willing and brave. So over the years, uh, we've been uh, in various community meetings talking about uh, the way to address this. And two parts to a solution have been identified. The first is an API, uh, which defines how match requests and responses are exchanged. Um, and so that includes a match request, uh, pending matches, operations, operations to update the match attributes, uh, which uh, is necessary if a person's name changes subs uh, after a match. So if your last name changes for whatever reason, the match engine still needs to know that in case <clears throat> you're uh, come back with the new name at some point down the road. Uh, design preference has been more or less indicated as JSON and REST. Uh, and, and the goal of the API is to assign this reference identifier that I mentioned before. We'll talk a little bit more about the, IP, uh, about the API uh, in the uh, third part of the uh, presentation. The second part of the solution is the match engine itself. And so the idea is that the match engine implements <clears throat> the rules for performing searches. So you define the attributes that are going to be searched. And then in the proposals that we've been talking about in the community, we've identified this concept of canonical versus potential rules, uh, where a canonical rule can uniquely identify a person, and if it matches, processing stops, if, if it exactly matches. Uh, and a potential rule can suggest ambiguous or fuzzy matches, but processing does not stop, even if exactly one match is found. The match engine also needs to maintain state, including the attribute updates that I mentioned before. Um, to wrap up this portion here, I just dug up this timeline. So uh, we've actually been out uh, about, uh, we've actually been working on this for a while, it turns out. Uh, the initial ID match straw man document that I found, which was before the API or any of the technical solutions were, were being worked on, dates back to apparently 2011. Um, so yeah, uh, 2012 was the first draft of what was at then called the Cypher straw man API. And for those of you who remember, Cypher predates uh, Tier and, and various other open source software initiatives. Uh, in 2013, uh, Berkeley developed a Java-based in-memory solution, which turned out not to be the best approach for some technical reasons we can get into later if, you, if folks are interested. Uh, in 2014, uh, Berkeley developed a Postgres-oriented solution, the idea being 
matching really just comes down to uh, 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 database queries. And why not just use a database that knows how to make those queries? So a proof of concept, which you may have seen in various uh, TechX presentations and others, was developed uh, around that. Uh, in 2015, uh, Berkeley ended up uh, with an internal implementation, which is what Summer will be talking about momentarily. In November 2017, so that was just late last year, TIER allocated funding to build out the match engine. And we're hoping to get the initial uh, release of that new component out real soon now. Um, so I think that's it for the first part. Uh, Keith, did you want to jump in here for a second while I swap out the screen share? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, thanks for the good technical background on things, Ben. That's helpful. Uh, the uh, chat seems to be pretty quiet so far. Of course, I just lost the chat panel, but I'm getting it back. Uh, so since we don't seem to have any questions at this point, I'm going to hand things over to Summer uh, to hear a little bit about uh, some of the, the functional pieces that can be laid on top of this technical infrastructure and really how the rubber meets the road, how this stuff works in the real world. So take it away, Summer. Thank you. Can you see my screen? You're good. Yep, you're good. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So identity matching at UC Berkeley is done via the Berkeley Person Registry. Um, to, to get started, I thought I'd give you all some definitions. Berkeley Person Registry is a custom developed Postgres database and a suite of applications that gathers identity, identity data from systems of record and provisions identity records. Our systems of record are campus systems, such as the human resources system, the student information system, and the alumni system that serve as our source of identity data. A primary key is an identifier unique to each SOAR and to each identity record, such as employee ID, student ID, alumni ID, or affiliate ID. A UID is a CalNet primary key. Uh, our raw data is in the form of a SOAR object, um, and it comes from a system of record and contains matchable data elements and is attached to a user record in Berkeley Person Registry by UID. Our match engine is an application that looks for matches between incoming SOAR objects and existing records. And then we use canonical rules, which is a rule that results in a match that we consider to be true and valid at first pass. And potential match rules um, are rules that find potential matches, which are reviewed later manually by a person. Um, and we use a partial match table, which is a staging table for matches that meet our potential match rules. Um, at UC Berkeley, data comes in from campus systems of record every morning and via message queues. Each system of record has a primary key. The incoming records are checked against existing primary keys, and if a primary key does exist, the existing record is updated in BPR. If the primary key does not already exist, a new SOAR object is created, which is then sent through the match engine. In this example of an auto match, the data on the incoming record on the left meets the canonical match rule criteria and is provisioned without human interaction. How does this actually happen? When an incoming record is sent to the match engine, matchable elements such as first, last name, date of birth, the last five of social security number, student ID number, etc., are extracted from the raw data in the SOAR object. A REST call is made to the match service. The match engine goes through matching rules starting with the canonical rules. And records that meet canonical criteria are matched and the UID is reprovisioned with updated identity data. Robert Jones in the previous slide is an example of an incoming record that met a canonical match rule and the result is one single identity record that contains identity data from multiple source systems. Incoming records that did not meet canonical match rules then go to our potential match rules. Potential match rules exist to find records that might be a match without actually making an incorrect match. The potential match rule allows us to cast a wider net in the hopes of preventing duplicate records from getting created. Um, records that meet potential match rule criteria are sent to a partial match table for human review 
From the match table, CalNet staff review raw data for additional data elements. We review the match table daily and look for elements such as email address, home address, phone number, et cetera, to verify a match. And although the match engine is really quite helpful, human review is sometimes still required. Honestly, matching is just really hard. Um, if no canonical or potential match is made, the CalNet staff will provision a record with a new UID. This is an edited screenshot of an example of a record in the partial match table. The incoming record displays above and the existing possible match is displayed below. These records match on first name, last name, and date of birth. So why isn't it a canonical match? The middle name is in a match and there's no primary key. The partial match will review will require additional review to determine if it is a true match. And so to do that, we would look at the raw data of both the incoming record on the top and the existing record on the bottom and see if we could definitively determine that they match. Match rules improvement. Um, Berkeley Person Registry and the Match Engine were implemented about three years ago. We first reprovisioned active records and incoming records from a new student information system. After the initial implementation, we found we could further improve our match rules. So looking at the potential match rule table and the duplicate records that were generated enabled us to find patterns and develop better rules. Updating match rules requires a developer to update the configuration inside of the match engine, which is honestly sometimes low priority in our workload. Um, and the CalNet support team continues to look for patterns and trends that will help our match engine work better. And Summer, we did have a question here about the, the name matching component. Um, oh, never mind. Ben actually said he'll, he'll answer that question later about the uh, okay. SoundX versus other options. So stay tuned for that. And sorry to interrupt. Thanks. Well, my next, my next bit is about gotchas, which are um, rules that result in unintended consequences. So I have two examples. One is arguably a bad rule that sometimes works, and one is a good rule that sometimes doesn't. Here I have an example of an obviously non-matching record that met the criteria of the potential match rules. My incoming record at the top has the same date of birth and similar names to the existing match candidates, but they are clearly not the same person. Um, this incoming record will get provisioned as a new record. To understand why this happens, we have to understand that matching is especially difficult for identity records with multiple last names, uh, for records with hyphenated last names, and for records where a first name may or may not include the middle name. This potential match rule was intended to capture all cases where a name is spelled slightly wrong or the name varies across systems of record. This is, I think, um, uh, something to think about in all of your match rules is our data is only as good as the people entering it. So if you have someone in HR who uses maybe one standard of data entry and somebody in student information services who looks at it differently, or even a person will give their name, their informal legal name on one record and their actual legal name on another record, it's harder to match those. So this rule is intended to try to find those cases. So in this rule, the potential given name needs to be a substring of the existing given name, which means that one value is a substring of the other. An example is J would be equal to Jeremy. The next part of the rule states that a surname must be a distance match, which means that the names are close, but not exact. And lastly, the date of birth has to be an exact match. So the actual result of this potential match rule is hundreds of non-matching records hitting the partial match table each month and having to be manually reviewed and manually provisioned. So this feels usually like a bad rule. Hundreds of matching, non-matching records have to be manually reviewed. But it also does occasionally find matches that would otherwise have been provisioned as a duplicate record. Gotcha number two is a canonical rule. This rule is pretty standard in matching. Records matching on first name, last name, and the last five of social security number are considered a canonical match. This, result, this rule resulted in three identity collisions over the last year out of 50,000 records provisioned. 
important. So that's pretty good odds. Um, luckily, I, these identity collisions tend to get noticed right away, and I'm able to split records fairly easily using fancy CalNet tools. Um, I know that other campuses have um, a much more difficult time splitting identity collisions. So I, I think that I'm really lucky that, to have the tools that I have. Um, and identity, identity collisions can turn into a really big deal if a user goes and creates an email address and enrolls in classes and changes personal information as another user, but we tend to catch them before that happens. So in summary, matching is not easy. Having a match engine is definitely helpful and analyzing your potential matches and your cases of identity collision makes for a better match engine. And we've had a couple questions come in during uh, these last couple slides. Uh, Jeremy and Ben have been kind enough to answer a couple of them in the chat. Uh, but one of the questions that came in uh, was, are there any controls on the input source systems and how users are allowed to input the, the data when it comes in? So I know um, from experience working in human resources that when you enter a record in the HR system, you have to use their legal name. Um, and I know from looking at matches and potential match table that SIS apparently doesn't have to use legal names. So um, I would have to ask, with the, ask the people who manage those systems to find out what controls they use. But it honestly would be nice if people had the same kind of methods of entering data. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, starting, starting with a, a level playing ground helps. Uh, we also has, have a question, if the tool allows uh, demapping to reverse matching errors. So um, the tools that I have allow me to split off a bad system, a bad sort object from an existing record. Um, and I can manually edit things um, directly in our LDAP and directly in Berkeley Person Registry if just splitting a SOAR off doesn't solve the problem. Um, so if, say, say somebody gets matched incorrectly and I catch it really quickly, I can split it off pretty quickly and then there's not a lot of work involved. If, again, some actual like action was taken to the account by the user, then the split will be more complicated um, and it just requires manual editing of the data. Okay, and we've, uh, we've had a question come in about the, the SLA for, for turnaround time for manual matches. Um, we try to get them every day. Do you mean, I'm sorry, do you mean for the potential match table? The manual review is routine. So if somebody's entered in the HR system, we say it takes one to three days before they can claim a CalNet account. It usually is just overnight. Um, if, if they get stuck in the match queue, it may take a day for somebody to get to it. Um, when we have a really high volume of incoming records, we spend more time um, to doing matches. And we also have um, staff in the student information system who has access to help us with matches for um, when we're inundated with incoming admits. So um, in general, it's I would say it's one to three days. Okay. Um, this other question that came in uh, about have you ever tried edit distance or general link or I'm not sure if that's a question for you or for for uh, Ben to represent or maybe even Jeremy to chime in in the chat. Yeah, I don't I don't know myself. Yeah, uh, so I, I can chime in a little bit on that. Uh, and actually, I also realized just as a quick technical note on Zoom, uh, the thread about distance matching started with a question that went just to the panelists. So I'm not sure attendees saw the original question, which was, uh, how are you matching SoundX edit distance or JAR? Um, so when we've been using distance in the chat and in the presentation, we've been basically talking about uh, Levenstein, I guess that's how you pronounce it, distance, which is a type of uh, edit distance matching, uh, as is JARO, I believe. Uh, uh, it has the advantage of shipping out of the box with Postgres, uh, thus the uh, use of it there, whereas I don't think Jarl include does. Uh, Soundex, uh, Soundex, uh, we explicitly uh, uh, scoped out of the initial, both the proof of concept and the uh, tier work that we'll talk about momentarily, uh, uh, because uh, it, it, 
it's noisy, I think is maybe the short version there. Um, there is support native to Postgres, but you end up getting a fair amount of uh, uh, fuzzy matches more than you might want. Um, Okay. I kind of lost track of where we are in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> there, there have been a lot of distant, uh, distance matching type questions in here. Um, and uh, I, I think maybe when we get into the third part uh, where, <clears throat> excuse me, where Ben talks about what's available, um, it may shed some light on, on what's available to the rest of us too as this moves forward. Um, there was a question for Summer, uh, how many question or how many potential matches uh, land in your review queue uh, in, in a, a year's time summer. And I'm, I'm also wondering just in more general terms, uh, I guess, percentage wise with, I know you're continuing to tweak and improve the rules, uh, but percentage wise, how, uh, how often does your matching get things right? And how often does it land in the, I'm not sure if this is a match and, and how often does it get things wrong? Right? So, I mean, we had it, it, we got it wrong three times last year, over 50,000 records. Um, potential matches really vary daily and monthly. So um, I would say on an average day when not much is happening, maybe we would have three come into the queue. This morning we had 20 waiting. Um, when students are getting admitted, we'll have th like 200 in the queue. So it really varies hugely on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I would say we could do a total guess and say 1,500 records hit the matching table every year, um, but that's really just a guess. Um, and so that means that all the rest of those 50,000 just got provisioned, either matched canonically or a new UID was provisioned. So and when you think, you know, most of the incoming records on this campus are students who have not been here before, that makes sense. Uh, most of those students are going to have a new record and won't get attached to a former um, record. All right. Three out of 50,000. I know a few major league baseball players who would like to have that kind of uh, percentage going for them. Right. It's, uh, pretty, it's pretty good. <laughs> that, is, that is quite good. We also had a question about, has anyone tried matching tables, equating Robert to Bob, Roberto, other nicknames. So our little distance rule, I think, was meant to, our, my, my example of a potential match rule that can be good or can be bad, um, that was kind of an attempt to do that. So I do think that we have some rules that will look at, that will pull things up like Robert, R Bob, and Roberto, and it'll end up in the potential match table usually. Um, I actually, I, I don't know all of the rules off the top of my head, so I'd have to look and see if any of the other canonical rules uh, consider that. But I know that and the potential rat rules. Is that, is that based on just the fact that those names are similar or does the system actually know that those are nicknames? I think that one, one I think that the system knows that. I think, but I, I guess I would have to defer to Jeremy. I feel like once upon a time I heard that there's a set of standard like nicknames and names that we, that we use, but I'm not entirely sure. Okay, and feasibility of creating rules to do the investigation instead of needing a human to uh, make an assessment. So, you know, in the end, there are going to be matches where a computer just can't tell. Um, and I think that it's, it's an interesting idea about like development, development in artificial intelligence. You know, it's like what happens what, what is needed to replace the human brain? Really, when you're, when you're looking at all of the data, sometimes you just have to go and look in different source systems. You have to look in different fields in raw data. So maybe if we analyze like every potential match and determined where we're seeing um, data that is matchable in different attributes coming in from different sores, we probably could end up with like fewer potential matches. But ultimately, there's just like inconsistency in data entry and in the data that different sores send in the attributes that they have and that they send to us. So ultimately, I think that there will always need to be human intervention for good matching. Okay, 
That's good. That's good. And one more question from the chat uh, before we pass things back to Ben. Uh, I was going to ask this anyway, and it kind of wraps this up nicely, but how, how many rules are there in your system and how much work is it to manage those? Obviously, you're, you're tweaking them, so I'm guessing the number changes. Yeah, and actually, um, I think we have five canonical and six potential matches. So, we, I mean, there's somewhere around a dozen total. Um, and I think I'm going to have that one that results in lots of non-potential matches deleted or edited. But um, really, you don't need a whole lot of rules, I think, as long as you have the potential matches that you can then review. Um, and I think our goal ultimately is just not to have rules that result in identity collision. So. Absolutely. That's the goal at the end of the day, not to, not to overcompensate. So, okay, good stuff. Um, to talk about the direction that some of this is going um, open source so that you too can play along at home and do your own identity matching on your university. I'm going to pass things back to Ben uh, so he can talk a little about something coming out of Tier. All right. Uh, thanks, Keith. Uh, there's actually two things uh, that I'll be talking about here, as you've all probably been staring at the same slide for the last five minutes. Uh, excellent questions coming from the chat, by the way, so thanks for that. Uh, I'll be talking about uh, the uh, tier ID match API and the actual match component, uh, a piece of software that's in the process of being developed. Uh, so the ID match API uh, is a RESTful design as we uh, hinted at earlier with the goal of obtaining that reference identifier. And the idea is that can, it can operate either synchronously or asynchronously. And what that really means is, is how the system of record interacts with it, either the registry, via the registry or directly, i.e. a system that can handle interactive fuzzy resolution is one that would be uh, uh, synchronous and one that requires, uh, say, because perhaps it operates over uh, uh, batch files, one that requires an admin to you know, look at the request uh, in order to resolve it is handled asynchronously. So the API is designed to handle either use case and to either be a standalone service or operate behind a registry. But the API also has the ability to be used for transitioning legacy systems. So if you've got a legacy registry that you want to wire up to the tier ID match component, or you have your own legacy ID match uh, system that you want to eventually transition, you can use the API as, as a way of uh, mitigating some of the risk around doing a transition, a, 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 a transformation of your uh, identity matching uh, infrastructure. So the API has existed in a straw man form for however many years ago it was on that previous slide. Uh, and just about a week or two ago, we've decided to start trying to formalize it in some way uh, as part of the tier API and registries working group. Uh, and formalize here means really something along the lines of edgy person, not not like an RFC or, or something that formal. Uh, and uh, as usual, we always find it helpful to align our goals with the major conferences, so we're trying to get this drafted in time for TechX. Uh, I'll be showing some examples of the API screenshots here, uh, and there are some attribute names that are used. They may change slightly uh, as we get these documents into some sort of semi-final uh, format. The ID match component was given a relatively tight initial scoping uh, just to facilitate its development. Uh, that included a UI driven configuration, uh, so that way you don't need developers to change match rules. Uh, and also the UI for handling ambiguous uh, match resolution, like uh, what Summer was showing. Uh, obviously, it would support the ID match API. <clears throat> and initially, it would support Postgres only. Uh, as I mentioned before, Postgres out of the box supports some nice matching routines. Uh, but possibly, support for MySQL or MariaDB and maybe other backends could be added later. Uh, specifically, I believe MySQL actually does have community extensions that provide uh, very similar functionality to what Postgres provides. Uh, the initial uh, scoping also include multi-tenancy, which is probably not a use case most deployers would have, uh, but in uh, multi-tenant systems uh, or, or hosted uh, for you know, multiple campuses, uh, that might be more useful. Uh, and there have been a ton of questions around matching uh, uh, algorithms in, in the chat. Uh, so the initial uh, release of the component will only support uh, Levenstein distance or edit distance matching uh, and substring matching initially. Uh, the question about Bob, Robert, et cetera, uh, came up. Uh, that's uh, what we're, we've been calling dictionary matching. And that's uh, on the roadmap for a subsequent release, uh, as I think somebody hinted about in the chat. The hard part 
part there is getting that database that says Rob equals Robert equals uh, Bob, et cetera. And there are some expensive commercial services that offer that, uh, but it would be nicer if we had <clears throat> a community oriented uh, and maintained uh, open source solution that we could uh, leverage instead. Uh, so that got scoped out uh, of the first release simply because that part of solving it is uh, fairly difficult. However, if you can define the dictionary, Postgres does offer that as, a, as an extension, the ability to uh, query the dictionary in your uh, SQL commands. Uh, the ID match component is currently being developed as part of the co-manage project. Uh, it does not require a co-manage registry, uh, which is probably the part of co-manage you've seen at one point or another to run. It can run completely standalone. Notable yet, uh, as we're trying to clean it up and get the documentation ready, uh, we hope to get some early access releases out uh, real soon now. And of course, TechX coming up is a great opportunity to uh, assert that we'll have a version one out, uh, hopefully, if not right then, then at least a release candidate. Uh, as you'll see in some of the screenshots that I've got coming up, uh, we have not put any effort into making the UI look good <laughs> yet. So that will be up next and will be for the version one release. And then of course, we need to get this over to the, the tier packaging group uh, to get uh, Dockerification, I guess. I'm not sure if that's a word, but we'll make it a word. Um, so this is a, a screenshot of the match engine configuration just to give you an idea of kind of how things are configured. So at the platform level, you've got uh, the concept of a match grid and the match grid is really the tenant on the system. So you can define more than one match grid if you want to, although again, most campuses won't have that use case. Uh, permissions are pretty much what you think they are. So I'm not really going to say anything more about that other than that they are there. Um, a match grid then has uh, various uh, things defined on it, uh, the most interesting of which being uh, attributes, and those are what you think they are, names, date of birth, uh, uh, national identifiers, that kind of stuff. Um, attribute groups are a way of linking attributes together. So for example, a first name and a last name get coupled together into an attribute group. And uh, the question was sort of hinted at before, can you handle official versus preferred names that way? And, and so in this system, you can. You can actually collect those separately if you wanted to. Um, the attributes are then collected into rules. And those are the same sorts of rules that we've been talking about uh, throughout the presentation so far. And uh, then or uh, basically configuration that will allow uh, an inbound uh, uh, data from you know, your SIS or your HR system to uh, have uh, certain characteristics or behave in certain ways. And then uh, the last things here are the reconcile unresolved requests. Uh, that takes you into the UI for reconciling unresolved requests. We won't look at that further in this session, but conceptually it's very similar to what uh, Summer was showing. Uh, thing of note here is that build button. So once you're done configuring, you click build and you don't have to go around and manually muck around in the database. Uh, you define your attributes and then the SQL is automatically executed to build the corresponding table. So uh, a match grid doesn't have too much in the way of direct configuration, but the interesting thing here is the reference ID assignment method. So when we create a unique identifier for a person uh, out of the box, we'll support two mechanisms for doing that. You can see here a UUID of type four, the other one being a sequence, basically just an integer. Uh, here's a sample of the systems of records that you might have to find. So in this particular instance, we've got an SIS, an HRMS, and a guest. You'll notice that the HR system is configured in interactive mode, uh, meaning we actually pass match candidates back over the API to the system uh, in the event of a fuzzy match, whereas the student and guest systems operate in external mode, meaning in the event of a fuzzy match, it gets queued for an administrator and the uh, system just gets a, uh, an interim processing response response effectively, or in HTTP speak, it gets a 202 response back. Uh, in this particular test instance, we've got five match attributes defined, date of birth, SSN, uh, first name, last name, and net ID. And you can see that the first name and the last name are, are grouped together. Um, I'll come back to these a little bit more uh, as we go through this, but here you can see an attribute configuration. So this is date of birth. You'll notice there's a free form API name field here. And I was mentioning before as part of the work we're doing where standardizing the attribute names and how they're presented on the wire. And so, for example, here, uh, this is how we're, I can't remember if this is actually what we settled on for date of birth or not, but if it's not, we'll change this around. Uh, the uh, important bit here is if you do have custom attributes that are not defined as part of the spec, uh, you can support them. Uh, you just define whatever your API 
representation of that attribute is going to be and plug it into the configuration. Uh, here we've defined this as an alphanumeric attribute. It's not case sensitive, which makes sense. It has no numbers in it. These other things invalidates null equivalence and required basically configure the attributes for searching. I'm, I'm not going to go into too much to, uh, about those right now. They're kind of very technical items. Uh, but you'll see here we've got a search distance of two. And so we've been talking about that distance matching on and off. Two is basically a transposition value. So it would allow 12 and 21 to fuzzy match with each other. Uh, and we allow date of birth to be used for exact matching. Um, so a new match request looks like this. I've got a URL here, and the first part is uh, basically the uh, end point at which the API listens. That takes us all the way through match slash API. The number three is the instance in the multi-tenant system. So this is effectively match grid number three. And then that takes us to the uh, ID match API portion of the URL. So that's v1 slash people. And then we've got slash the system of record name. In this case, this example, it's the student system. And then the student system's unique identifier. So like the impl ID or, or something like that. 3683249711 here. We we put that to the endpoint. We put this uh, JSON blob to the endpoint, and you can see here this is for Jay Clark, born on August 23rd, 1999, and with a uh, national identifier number of 995005320. Now, we don't say anything about this being an SSN. Uh, it's just an identifier that happens to have a label of national on it. So, for example, you could not use this, or you could hash it and just transfer hashed SSNs. Uh, of course, there you lose the ability to do transposition detection. Uh, but uh, point being, this is configurable according to uh, what your local needs and requirements are. In this case, there is no matching record back, so we get back a 201 response and this reference ID, which is a type 4 UUID, uh, which is now how the match identifier, how the match system, match engine uniquely identifies this person. Uh, in the next example, I'm going to send a, uh, an intentionally fuzzy match. Uh, and so to, before we do that, I just wanted to now enumerate what the rules are that we're looking at here. So uh, the C rules, C1 and C2, are canonical, P1 and P2 are potential. So basically, we process from left to right in this grid. Uh, and we treat each attribute as, as it's listed. So we're not providing net IDs, which means, for example, C2 and P2 will never match. So really, the only rules that are in place are C1 and P1 here. So, and Ben, I'm going to ask you at this point, because we got a question in the chat uh, about sharing the, the rules. I think it was directed at Summer, sharing the rules that Berkeley are using. But uh, more general, will this ship with any basic sample rules to get you started? I think, uh, so that's a great question. I think what we're likely to do is put some documentation together that says here are some default rules you might think of as a starting point. Uh, whether or not they'll automatically be instantiated when you install the software is probably an open question at the moment. Um, I think the community is likely to be able to come up with some common use cases, but I suspect most campuses will end up needing their own slight tweaks. And I, I could see a community page where folks could, could share their rules to give others some inspiration for, for better matching uh, ideas. So, all right, carry on. Let's see the fuzzy match. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. Um, so in this case, uh, what we're, the example I'm going to show, I just transposed the social security number two digits in there. So that means the rule C1 will not match because the social security number is not an exact match. As I mentioned, we don't have net IDs, so we skip rule C2, and we end up at rule P1, which accepts a, a to a distance of two, or basically transposition, uh, as part of the potential match. So that will generate a, a fuzzy match on P1. So here's that same screenshot again, uh, except now uh, we're placing the request to slash HRMS. So it's an HR record. And we've got the HR impl ID as the system record ID in the uh, URL. And there you can see uh, the identifier was previously two zero, and this time I'm sending zero two instead, but the rest of the attributes are the same. And I get back a 300 response. Uh, I actually just copied the text out and uh, put it into the slide directly so we could make the JSON prettier and easier to read. Um, Although it looks like the circle got misaligned, and so now it's circling the wrong two digits, but uh, I think you get the idea. So in this case, this response says we have uh, one or more fuzzy candidates that we've identified. Uh, it's only one, obviously, because we haven't loaded that much data in. Uh, but you can see the reference ID is the reference ID that was assigned to the SIS record. Uh, and in fact, we've returned the SIS data here uh, in order to provide the uh, administrator information to help resolve the request. Uh, now, again, that has uh, data privacy considerations and as to who has access to, to this sort of thing, but, but we'll 
skip those for, for this demo. Um, the idea being in this case that, um, oh, I, yeah, so uh, in this case, because the system of records is interactive, there's actually no pending request for the match administrator to review in the match engine itself. The, effectively, no state has changed at this point in the match engine. Um, it's up to the calling system to decide uh, what to do at this point. Uh, obviously, if it were non-interactive, then there would be a pending request in the database uh, that a match administrator would look at. So in this case, since it's interactive, there are two options. One is if the administrator uh, at the, who did the data entry uh, notices that the typo of the SSN, they could just fix the SSN and that would, and then resubmit the request. Uh, the other would be uh, the API defines something called a forced reconciliation request where you can uh, submit the reference identifier with your data and then effectively force that record to link together. Obviously there's some business process and technology development issues uh, there that need to be thought about, uh, but it, in a sense that's one level up from the API. Talking about reviewing the fuzzy matches might be a good place to insert uh, the question that uh, Dave Bartholomew asked over on the QA uh, section. Um, reminder for folks to use the chat section, not the QA, QA section, by the way, not to beat up on Dave. Um, but um, when evaluating fuzzy matches, is there, does this tool have any way of saying this is maybe fuzzy or, oh, this is pretty certainly a match or this probably isn't a match or is it just kind of it's a match, it's not a match, or it's just this general third maybe category. Right, I'll, I'll just say in the Q&A, the reason we weren't using it is because we couldn't figure out how to submit questions to it. So, uh, so Dave- Well, we congratulations, Dave did. Find a pointer to it. There we go. <laughs> um, right, so the, the API actually does sort of have something along those lines. The API has a, uh, a, a confidence value in it. Um, and in theory, the match engine uh, could assign a value that says, you know, 93 and therefore, you know, likely exists, you know, 72 and you know, I'm not sure you should do anything with this kind of thing. Uh, the initial version of the software isn't going to do much with that, uh, but the API does provide that capability. And I think over time, as we evolve the code base, we may be able to, to handle kind of more sophisticated and subtle, uh, 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 you know, decision-making questions like that. Okay, cool. All right, uh, last bit here, uh, which is good because I think we're, we're just about running to the top of the hour here. Uh, just uh, some notes on performance considerations. Uh, so search times will vary according to the configured attributes that you have, the quantity and complexity of the confidence rules and the number of records in the database. This is probably all fairly straightforward stuff, but it's, it's worth observing that, uh, that uh, how you set things up can influence uh, uh, things. Uh, it's a database under the hood, so exact matching is, you know, about the same as exact matching with fuzzy matching rules attached, uh, and that's because the database can partition the search space uh, based on the exact matches, and a fuzzy only match is, is going to be your, your least performant uh, query. Um, the, uh, in our proof of concept phase, depending on kind of how all these factors uh, come into play, we've seen search times on the order of, you know, 15 or 20 milliseconds at the best case to, you know, 500 milliseconds for the worst case. So usually it skews more towards the, to the faster end until you start doing, you know, really crazy things. Uh, we don't have data yet on the new system that's, uh, that's on the to-do list, but we'll hopefully provide some actual numbers uh, there coming up. And this was, of course, with just three or four rules in there, so your mileage may vary as you add more complex rules, I assume. Uh, certainly more fuzzy rules. You can actually have a fairly large number of exact matching rules before you start to uh, run into performance issues. But uh, if you just think in terms of databases and indices and that kind of thing, uh, then certainly the more fuzzy rules are going to take longer to process. Okay, very good. Uh, the last slide here, I just have a couple pointers to some documentation uh, uh, at the brand new Internet2 spaces at Internet2 Wiki. Uh, links to the Strawman API and the initial documentation of the ID match component. There's not too much there yet, so don't you know, don't go looking for all sorts of excessive amounts of detail, but uh, we are adding content there over the next several days. So hopefully uh, uh, we'll have a much more uh, robust set of information for the ID match component up soon. Um, I, I think that's about it for me. Okay. Uh, Summer, the question we had earlier about sharing rules, um, is, is that something if someone were to contact you or Jeremy, uh, UC Berkeley would be willing to share their matching rules, or is that not for public consumption? No, I think we can share them. Um, let me check in with the team. Okay. All right. If uh, 
if folks are interested in in that, maybe they can contact you uh, directly. Yeah, I'm S. Scanlon at berkeley.edu. So Jeremy says individually for sure, maybe not published. So if you're interested in seeing what our rules are, you can just email me at S. Scanlon at berkeley, B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y dot E-D-U. Very good. All right. And Jeremy chimed in in the chat with a similar message. So very good. You guys agree. All right, we are just out, about out of time. So we would ask you to please fill out the evaluation. The link is on the screen, as Dean said in the chat. Uh, and the results of uh, the evaluations uh, help us to improve the webinar series, um, as well as to gather potential topics uh, for, for future IAM Onlines. A couple of other announcements before we wrap things up. The annual Internet 2 Technology Exchange coming right up in October, October 15 through 19 in beautiful sunny Orlando. And we'll have two tracks as we have in the past for trust and identity, uh, as well as we'll have the fantastically fun unconference advanced camp format, which if you've never been to advanced camp, you don't know what you're missing. And finally, uh, if you are a fan of Grouper, speaking of not knowing what you're missing, you don't want to miss the next I Am Online, which is going to have uh, plans on the upcoming version of Grouper, uh, as well as information from the Grouper deployment guide. That's going to all be in the September I Am Online, so stay tuned to your email for more information on that. But that is all we have for this month's I Am Online. So thank you again for joining us, and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you.